Thank you very much indeed. I, I must admit, I'll, I'll be in Toulouse tomorrow. I was in Utrecht yesterday, but this, this center is really sort of, uh, you know, top piece, definitely. I'm sure you'll agree that this is a, a quite a special place to be, and so many people as well interested in the topic. Uh, so I'll be discussing AI a little bit. I'm CTO over Capgemini's Insights and Data Practice. So I'm in Patrick's uh, CTO network, and um, the Insights and Data Practice is globally interested in anything data, so AI, analytics, big data, uh, BI, data warehousing, everything data, essentially. And AI clearly is a, a topic of great interest right now to, uh, to many of our clients and, and technology partners. I do have a message for you. Uh, winter is coming. <laughs> you know, winter is coming. Winter is coming, and I get a lot of questions. Is, is another AI winter coming as well? Some of you may have heard of AI summers and winters. There have been a lot of expectations around AI, even around the 50s and later on in the 80s and the 90s. I'm sure some of you studied information technology somewhere in the 80s, maybe worked with expert systems and other things that at that time we used to call artificial intelligence. A lot of expectations at that time around AI and then in, in, in practice didn't work out the way it, you know, and everybody thought it would be. So we got an AI winter and, and uh, investments were stopped. Uh, people you know, um, stopped their pilots, didn't work on the capabilities anymore and we had an AI winter. So now I get the same question. So much enthusiasm for AI. Are we in for another AI winter? Should we uh, you know, brace ourselves? I, I don't think so, to be honest. And, and if we go back to, to, uh, to when AI started, uh, we, we start to realize it's, uh, it's always been our, um, you know, our ambition to create something artificial outside our own intelligence. You may have heard of, um, uh, that there, there was a thing the, around 1770, so end of the 18th century, there was this Hungarian inventor, uh, Wolfgang von Kemperlingen, and he invented a chess robot. And the only reason he did it, by the way, was to impress the uh, Austrian empress, uh, Maria uh, Theresa. So, so this is a golden rule, by the way, if you want the guys to be creative, uh, probably let them impress a woman and it's probably go much faster than and uh, much more um, output. But he did it to impress the, uh, the empress. He created a chess robot. It was a doll, a mechanical doll. It had a turban. So they called it the Turk. Uh, it's, it's not the area of political correctness at that time, you know, so they, they called it the Turk, the thing. And it was a chess grandmaster. It sat at a table and he could open up the thing and you saw all sorts of wheels and mechanisms and it all looked, you know, really impressive. And the thing could beat grandmasters. And certainly also the royals, which wasn't that difficult compared to, you know, so, so the, the thing made a tour across Europe. And for over 80 years, it was sort of a miracle in terms of how does that thing able to beat chess masters and, and anybody else that tries to, to, to beat it. And, and so, so uh, it was a very long and secret, and it was, I, I guess, one of the first notions of artificial intelligence. It was a robot, and actually with a lot of intelligence, being able to, to beat grandmasters at chess. Now, the thing was, it was a bit artificial, artificial intelligence because there was a human inside. Uh, he had a, the, the inventor, the Wolfgang, had created a very smart set of mirrors. So at the outside, it looked all sorts of mechanisms, like the mainframe servers of the past used to have all sorts of blinking lights, remember? They did nothing, these blinking lights. They were solely there to impress people. Look at my data center. Here's a mainframe. Look, it's doing things. So lights are blinking. These lights mean nothing, in case you don't know. They are totally useless, but very impressive. So he had all the mechanisms there, and then there were little mirrors, like, like a, uh, you know, illusion. And people didn't see that there was actually somebody inside. And there was a little set with mirrors over there, so we could see the, the board on top of it. And there was a, a grandmaster inside, probably not a very big one, by the way, <laughs> and, and was, was able to beat many of them, right? And, and that's the way it works. So it was artificial, artificial intelligence. And even nowadays, Amazon, they, they have a, a web service, which they call the Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk, maybe you've heard of it. And you actually ask a question to the system, you know, find three pictures of purple unicorns or translate these three sentences to Polish or whatever, and you get answer back, usually in 20, 30 seconds for these micro tasks. And it seems like it's a system, it's an AI that is doing it for you, but in practice, already for more than a decade, there are actually people there as well, behind their screens, waiting for a micro task to come in, do it, deliver it within 20 seconds, and send it back. And it feels like magic as well. It's actually artificial, artificial intelligence as well. Funny thing is, if you look back 10 years, from, uh, 10 years back, 
when Amazon launched their Mechanical Turk, there were still a lot of tasks like select a few pictures of purple unicorns or translate these three sentences to perfect Polish or whatever micro task you would have. It, it still would be uh, difficult, so they had to put in humans there. And nowadays, also Amazon are finding more and more that many of these tasks that were deemed typically human or impossible to really deliver by an AI now are, are definitely be able to, uh, to be produced by true AI, artificial intelligence as well. So, so um, I, I think there's a few reasons why, uh, why we shouldn't um, at any time soon expect an AI winter. I actually predict to you a very long, prolonged, hot AI summer. Uh, and, and we don't even need global warming for that. It's, uh, you, know, you don't need global warming to predict that that will happen. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that and show you some use cases particularly, which I think is also uh, maybe the, the, the main topic of uh, today. But I also would like to build a little bit further on what Patrick just mentioned as our Technovision thing. It's our trends document. And we're actually about to release an autumn update, 2018 autumn update. And guess what? It's called the impact of AI. And we actually go through literally every big technology area. So not just data or analytics or whatever, but we literally go through every technology area and have done some assessment of the impact of AI on it. And uh, I, can, I can really uh, give you the spoiler that, that there's literally no technology area unaffected uh, by the impact of, uh, of AI. So that's what I would like to show you a little bit as well, just to give you a preview, sort of a sneak preview in what we are about to release. And then I also would like to give you some pragmatic pointers in terms of how to actually get busy with AI. AI is such a big topic, and, and we'll discuss ethics uh, soon after, you know, after my speech. We'll be discussing ethics because it's so important. But the impact on society as a whole, you know, the whole future of labor, for example, uh, are all very critical topics that we need to discuss and we need to get engaged with it. Shouldn't uh, keep us from, from actually getting applied. With AI already today and, and the more successful companies we're currently working with we have some examples of these uh, you know they, they take an applied approach and learn while doing so reaping some of the early benefits uh, without immediately getting stuck in the analysis paralysis of what could happen in the forthcoming years we need to address that clearly but if we want to be informed when discussing it we better get some actual applied grip on AI so that will be my, uh, my third topic. So, so let's quickly dive into um, why there won't be an AI um, winter anytime, uh, anytime soon. Um, first, of course, we need a, uh, a definition of AI. Uh, in case you didn't know, uh, there are many AI experts, but there are more definitions of AI. Any, every AI expert seems to have at least a few different definitions of what, um, what AI is. Um, we worked a little bit within the CTO network and with some of our uh, AI leaders, and we came up with a very pragmatic definition. If humans perceive it as intelligence by a system, it's probably AI. Why? Because it's clearly a system. And on the other hand, it shows what we would perceive as intelligence, so probably artificial intelligence then. The thing is, it, it, it sort of leaves behind this idea of it, it always needs to be a human-style intelligence, as we will see in a few minutes. There's a lot of cognitive capabilities in AI that we typically associate with people, humans. Uh, but there's also a lot of intelligence that goes uh, quite beyond what we're able to absorb as humans. And that's intelligence to me as well. It's just not the, uh, the typical intelligence we, uh, we know as, uh, as humans. Uh, the tip I would have for you is if you want to uh, describe uh, AI is not to get stuck in definition wars. Uh, leave that to the AI experts and keep them busy with that. But actually give examples. As, as you can see over here as well, there's a lot of examples, and that works better for me. You know, here's, here's image recognition, here's audio um, uh, recognition, here's conversational systems, here's very complex analytics. They're sometimes uh, overseen. Uh, everybody seems to focus a lot on, for example, image recognition, which is powerful. And we'll see a lot of examples today, uh, but, but also the, uh, the, the way to do some predictive and prescriptive analytics with an accuracy that we've never seen before. Are, uh, are quite important for the, for the rise and the current popularity of, uh, of AI as well. So, so um, th there's two, th I, I would say there's a few drivers behind the current popularity of AI that, uh, that go way beyond what we've seen so far. Uh, first of all, the, something we all need to know a little bit is, is deep learning neural networks. Uh, it's a big uh, breakthrough. Um, it's, uh, it's a way of, uh, of matching input to output, so train you learn from training data, which has input, and there's a certain consequence of that data set. 
and you start to adapt yourself using a system that some people compare to the uh, the brain. Uh, I think that's uh, highly exaggerated. It's not. It's a very simple mechanism. It's the dumbest mechanism ever, by the way. If you think that deep learning and neural networks is something extremely intelligent, there's, there's not something dumber that you could possibly find than, a, than a, a deep learning neural network. The thing just consists of thousands of thousands of tiny little buttons, think of it like that, that simply try to adjust themselves, influencing each other some way in order to match better input into output. And then you get a next data set and with input and you're better able to predict output because you have tuned yourself over so many training data to better adjust to the input and output and turning all the little buttons, you have no clue what you're doing. You're just looking if turning left is better than turning right, literally, actually, and, and, and to try to see if the, if the match between input and output gets better. It's the dumbest thing ever, trust me. It's the dumbest thing ever. Uh, but people think it's magic, right? And, and a lot of people currently discussing should, should neural networks and deep learning, in the end, should AI have a citizenship or something? Are they conscious? If you know what is the technology behind it, you're, you're done with that idea. Be because nothing could be dumber, nothing could be more, you know, metal, cold, uh, non-living than that. But it's extremely powerful. And, uh, but it's difficult to explain how it works. Imagine a little child uh, trying to learn how to catch a ball. We've all done it, although we cannot remember it because we were too young. But we had to try and we, we couldn't, we didn't know at first how to do it, right? We, just tried to catch the ball, didn't work, and it dropped. And eventually, we adapted ourselves to, to, to catch the bloody thing, right? And, and we sort of, you know, sort of adapted ourselves. And in the end, if you would ask a child, how did you do it? It wouldn't say, I used a statistical algorithm, right? Or, <laughs> you know, um, it's logic, it's logic. There was a recipe over here that I followed. No, you were an organism that adopted itself, sort of, in order to, to catch the ball. And actually, a deep learning neural network is nothing different from that. It sort of adapts itself. And then later on, if you would ask, if you could ask it, how did you do that? It says, I don't have you know, the, the faintest clue. Uh, it's just very accurate. And that's the way deep learning neural networks work. This is an ethical thing, by the way, because we have to discuss, OK, this thing is extremely accurate. It is a man-made thing. But actually, the way it, for example, um, recognizes a cat from a dog, uh, it's actually quite difficult to explain why it is, and, and actually it can't really, really explain how it is. It's just matching patterns and getting better and better and better at it, but it, it doesn't know that it tries to distinguish cats from dogs, right? Or what a cat or a dog is. If you show a little child, again, uh, three pictures of purple dragons, to stay in winter is coming anyway, uh, if you show it three pictures of uh, purple dragons, uh, it will recognize purple dragons from then on. A, an, an AI system, you need to show them thousands and thousands of them before it starts to understand it. So people often tell me, hey, that's cheating. It's not like the way humans do it. No, it's artificial, right? It's artificial, for heaven's sake. It's artificial. It's not the same. It's AI, remember? It's not the way people do it. It's a dump mechanism, but extremely powerful and difficult to explain. So that's one. This is a big breakthrough. Um, the second one, I think, is all often underestimated. But, but for example, there might be a few people from government here today as well. A lot of unstructured text there, a lot of spoken words, a lot of you know, uh, language over there. And I think there's a lot of breakthroughs in the past few years with, with semantic web and understanding text. Actually understanding what's in a text, not, not make it searchable or something. Actually understand the meaning of something, including irony, if you like, which is useful in, in, in England, you, you know. So understanding irony as well is uh, particularly important. And uh, we're getting better and better systems to do it. It's just a few years ago that IBM got their AI breakthrough with Watson. And, and they, they beat uh, the, the champions at Jeopardy, right? And they simply did it by, by absorbing an entire Wikipedia. And, and you know, get a semantic understanding of everything in that and, and, and uh, lots of additional sources. And then it couldn't be beaten anymore in terms of understanding the, the, the question and the answer, or that begins with the answer, right? And then getting the question that belongs to it. So, so actually, natural language technologies are, are quite crucial in this whole breakthrough as well. They're often underestimated, but to my experience, a lot of companies that are currently successful with AI um, benefit a lot from these uh, natural language processing capabilities because there's so much text. Whether you're an engineer at, at Daimler trying to, to make sense of 15,000 pages of, of technical manual trying to serve a car, 
uh, or you're at customs somewhere and, and you're quickly trying to, to understand um, what's the liability of, of or, you know, somebody entering the, the, the country and there's a lot of unstructured text there somewhere with, with related topics that might give you an indication how risky that would be. Uh, all of that is uh, extremely uh, powerful as well. So it's, I would say the breakthroughs in these two areas that really explain the reason why, why an AI currently is so popular are the advances in deep learning neural networks on one hand and, and let's say natural language processing on the other hand. And then there is a, uh, a third um, uh, reason is of course the, um, the availability of huge amounts of training data. This is what big data brought us in the past few years. Uh, in Technovision 2018, by the way, we officially declare the end of big data because everything is big nowadays. Actually, small data is much more interesting in, in 2019, as you will see. Uh, you know, having pre-trained models that are already 80% in industry best practice AI model, and you add just a few, 20% of it with your own corporate data, and you get a very well-trained model. So you actually have small data rather than big data. It's sort of a, uh, a thing that we're currently seeing a lot. Get some smarter algorithms so that you don't need to figure it out uh, all yourself. Having said that, training data is absolutely crucial. Autonomous driving cars, they need hundreds and thousands of different, let's say, pictures and video stills, and video, Im and video footage of, of real situations, and they're still marked by people, they're still annotated by people to say, hey, here's a pedestrian, uh, here's, here's an obstacle, there's another car, this is a free road, right, here's an exit, and so on and so on. The, the, the system needs to be trained, and as I said, a, a deep learning neural network needs hundreds and thousands of pictures, if you like, of purple dragons before it starts to be able to distinguish it from other things. And then it gets very good at it. It gets really, really, really good at it, by the way, as long as you have sufficient training data. There are other ways to get that training data as well, by the way. So, so one of the ways they currently companies like the Teslas of this world get it is by crowdsourcing. These micro tasks I just described to you on Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk actually can be used to annotate pictures as well. Hey, I have uh, t 10 minutes uh, left right now uh, before my lunch break. Let's annotate a series of pictures and, and make a few cents, right, in, in doing so. It's actually something that thousands of people across the world do on a daily basis. We've also found that sometimes synthetical data, so, so f simulated, generated data, uh, could be synthetic, if you like, synthetic data is, is very useful as well. Already last year during the sea wind, we showed a, uh, a little mini car finding autonomously its way. It was an autonomous car, as we all know them nowadays. It could find its way in a little maze on the, on the floor. It was a mini thing. But we trained the thing entirely outside without real training data. We just put it in a simulated environment and, and let it kill people a million times. No, literally, just, just try it. Oh, sorry, so, you know, I, I bashed into something or, or, you know, I killed somebody or I got stuck or whatever. Let's try again. Let's learn from it, trying to catch that ball, right? Let's learn from it. You do it over and over again. Hey, that one is more effective in, uh, you know, uh, avoiding certain obstacles. Let's, let's try to combine these, uh, these learnings with mine and get better and better and better. And, and so, so then you don't even need real life data to actually get an extremely accurate car that's able to avoid. Uh, um, and then you put it in real life on the ground and it finds its way without ever have seen any real footage of that situation, right? We've seen the same um, with, with, with Microsoft, working with Microsoft, you have uh, electricity poles, right? And all on the top over there, they're sending out drones nowadays to see if there's damage potential in order to be preemptive in terms of, you know, uh, we need to repair it before it really breaks down. And it's very difficult to get picture footage of these things uh, fr from above. So they actually generated a lot, again, of synthetic data there as well, and, and trained the drones, the, the models on, inside the drones, that is, uh, with, with, that, with that generated data as well. So, so that there's many other pictures of what a damage would look like from, from above and without ever actually acquiring this as well. So data, and it's uh, usually one of the first things that we would ask our clients if they want to go busy with AI. What data do you have, right? What data is differentiating in your business? What data would actually be valuable to train a system on? And, and what knowledge is contained in that data, now still hidden, not used? How could we actually apply it? So, so that's uh, uh, a, a very important one, I think. And, and then definitely breakthroughs in technology really um, explain why there's so much uh, enthusiasm for, uh, for AI as well. And this is thanks to the gaming industry, by the way. 
Many of you are probably building uh, complex software. It's nothing compared to gaming software. If you, if you look at uh, you know uh, all these different uh, high, highly complex, sometimes role-playing based games, they are extremely complex. <coughs> they have this, this real-time rendering of graphics, but then also the interplay between all the, the, the players in, uh, you know, in, in games like World of Warcraft is uh, incredibly complex, incredibly complex. It's, it's, you know, it's really complex software. And, and, and these people, they, they needed, particularly for their graphics, they needed these GPUs, uh, graphic processing units. And these are uh, accelerators on chip that are actually destined to, to optimize rendering of graphics. And then they found out, hey, what do you know? That's also extremely suitable for uh, a neural network because it's the same thing, it's nodes and edges and they're combined, it's actually very suitable for neural network, what do you know? And they started to use these highly specialized uh, processor architectures for AI purposes as well and that gave a tremendous boost. So, so the fact that we can now store data thanks to big data, that's important, right? Uh, and so we, we can actually keep it for, for quite a few years and then use it for analytical purposes but now we also have the processing power to actually very quickly uh, do that, and it's dedicated hardware. I'm sure many of you have your iPhone 10 with you nowadays. It's an expensive thing, but hey, it's Apple. And, and you look at the thing and it unlocks, right? Because it recognizes your face. That's a neural network on board, on chip, that is able to do that in an instant. And it would be unthinkable without, without um, the, uh, the uh, on board, on chip type of technology we see nowadays. So, so that's interesting because we'll see these neural networks not only um, um, in, in the big cloud-powered uh, centers, of course, where we're working, but it's also getting more and more interesting uh, at the edge. A term you may hear, hear more today, and certainly in the forthcoming years, is edge AI, and edge computing, or even edge cloud, in which we're saying, okay, there, there's the big number crunching training that's going on somewhere in the cloud, probably with highly advanced, uh, you know, racks and racks and racks of, of GPU style processes. But then sooner or later it needs to be in a device, right? Somewhere embedded in a device to actually work. Because there's a difference between training a model and then you have that little working neural network, for example, you have to put it somewhere. And it works, right? It's different. It's, it's, it's not necessarily trained at that point anymore. It's actually doing its job, right? It recognizes your face, for example, once it has recognized uh, your face. And it's the same with cars, autonomous cars. They, they need to be completely autonomous in terms of shouldn't be connected to the internet in order to be able to drive, right? You have a little problem then. Sorry, you know, we're out of connection right now. That's a tiny little problem. Yeah, we're driving um, 80 on the, on the highway, but you know, it's sorry about that. We don't have cloud connection right now. Uh, ju just hold on, we'll be back soon. It's, it's not exactly what you want, right? So, so we'll see a lot of autonomous devices, um, like, like the, 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 the things that you see on the autonomous farm as well, by the way, they're all on themselves. Uh, you send out a drone, it goes to inspect these uh, uh, electricity poles all the way up, up there, and uh, they're autonomous. They, they do it themselves, and they have edge technology on board, on chip, uh, in the device itself. And as IT people, uh, we, st we start to realize that it's becoming part of the entire infrastructure we're dealing with, right? And it's extremely interesting. But it's a different world. It's the world of edge, right? It's where the real world and the digital world truly meet. And, and it's one of the most interesting battlegrounds, I think, in the forthcoming years to, to be successful with, uh, with artificial intelligence. So what does it all lead to? I, I found, as I said, that, uh, that AI really, the, the best thing to discuss about AI are use cases. So what are we actually doing in real business with these cases? Uh, within Capgemini's architecture community, uh, we, we've been uh, collecting already for quite some time now uh, hundreds of different use cases that we've been creating with our clients uh, across the world in, the, let's say, the past two years based on these type of technologies. And there is a variety of different use cases you see over there. Everybody likes the idea of a warehousing drone, right? We get that. And nobody wants to, to do an inventory at night uh, in an IKEA warehouse or wherever, right? But if you could send in a drone, and it automatically recognizes all the pellets and, and can scan the codes and use all sorts of other image recognition uh, tools to see it. Uh, we, we realize um, that's, that's you know, extremely effective and, and also um, releases a lot of people from doing very boring, potentially even dangerous work. It's, it's the same with, with uh, radiology. If we're able, by the way, nowadays to find exoplanets in vast maps of the galaxy, 
so much more effective with deep learning than people ever would be able to do, based, by the way, on a lot of historical data in which people did try to find it out themselves. And now we have deep learning neural networks that can find exoplanets <coughs> you know, uh, much more uh, effectively than humans ever possibly could do. It's not so hard to imagine what it would do to medical, medical solutions as well, where we're able, for example, in radiology already to, to first of all, um, tell when we should apply radiology, but also if we're actually involved in radiology and looking at scans, actually would be extremely uh, effective and to the point uh, and be able to, um, to, to identify potential danger, right? And be very proactive and preemptive in terms of, of dealing with that. Um, it's also in, in terms of uh, the um, awareness of a complex context. If, if, if there's a claim, for example, in insurance, there's many different um, factors to take into account. Some of them are based on unstructured text. Uh, some of them might be highly regulated and, and might be algorithms. In essence, it's almost too much to absorb for a human, so it might take quite some time before you actually have uh, assessed a claim and, and have assessed its risk. And if you have an AI that is actually able to, to be much more absorbing be, be because we simply created that, that ability to absorb so much have a combination of natural language processing combined with, with a neural network that can see complex relationships, that uh, complex relations that people cannot see, then, then you realize that, that in that area, for example, in claims processing, or for example, at customs for that matter, uh, we can benefit a lot from, from this highly powerful combination. And so there, there are many more, uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate. Um, um, pothole detection, for example, um, until uh, recently, um, at, at, uh, at Dutch roads, you know, the, they collect thousands and thousands of pictures every day of the roads, and then they're trying to detect the potential damage and potholes and then send in the crew. And it's a lot of manual work, a lot of people working on it. It's not exactly uh, stimulating work. And, and again, if you have enough training data, then, then you're actually able to, um, to go um, much faster through it and actually automatically detect them. And sooner or later, you realize that they're much more effective, not only faster, work 24 hours a day, no labor union. And, and also uh, much more accurate, right, in, uh, in, uh, in detecting it. And everybody now starts to, wear, to get aware of conversational systems, so chatbots, uh, whether it's uh, a voice assistant like Alexa. Uh, I'm sure there are many Alexas over here in the UK as well. And, and, and it would, all, uh, again, be a combination of voice, which, uh, you know, in order to recognize a voice, you need a deep learning neural network. And then in order to actually understand the intent of what you're saying, it's something very different and you need the semantic, the, the natural language processing capabilities as well. And if you combine the two, you get a voice assistant that actually starts to get you better and better and better, and actually understands your intentions rather than just, hey, it's your voice, and you said something, you know, uh, but it's ironic. Uh, well, it's still not very good at that, by the way, but they're getting better even at irony, right? If, if we're able to detect irony, by the way, that's the final frontier probably. And uh, we really know that we're now we're good at conversational technologies, right? It's the same with chatbots. They get better and better again in, in insurance and financial services and banking. We see the uh, uh, use uh, of, of chatbots a lot. There's a company, insurance company in the US, which is called Lemonade, and, and they are AI first. They, they created a business model in which every in, um, inquiry you have towards the company essentially is done by chatbots. Extremely effective. And, and as a last resort, you, you might get in touch with a, with a human, but uh, not in 95% of the cases. So, so extremely effective, so, so all of that. And there is much more, I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate. Uh, you may want to reach out to your uh, favorite uh, Capgemini architect, if you have one, of course, and, and ask a little bit for, for, for more information about this huge catalog of, uh, of different use cases uh, in all sorts of different industries, in all sorts of different levels of, uh, of, of uh, being advanced as well. Um, one, one frontier I would like to mention to you is a lot of this is augmenting human intelligence, right? But what if we go beyond that and actually be able to do things that humans couldn't possibly do? Uh, we've seen, of, of course, the famous AlphaGo system by Google was able to beat uh, the world champions in Go, and Go was considered a board game that nobody, you know, nobody could actually create a computer that could win that. It was the final frontier for games. Then came Google with their, uh, with their DeepMind um, AlphaGo system. And they, it was deep learning and reinforcement learning, so, so trying to play 300 million games. You, you try to beat that as a human, you know, play 300 million games of Go and see what you learn. Uh, that's, that's what the system literally did. It also did it with, uh, and Microsoft did this, with uh, Miss Pac-Man. 
Everybody knows Pac-Man, very simple game, just eat up and, and, and make sure you're not eaten. That's but there's a female version of it. Mrs. Pac-Man is much more complex, obviously. That's why they call it. <laughs> that's not just eat or be, be eaten, no, it's very complex. It's complicated, it has multiple layers, it has all sorts of complex dimensions for some reason, and they called it Mrs. Pac-Man. And it was considered a game that nobody ever could create the perfect score. Impossible, cannot do it, too complex. Impossible, too many dimensions, too many layers. Then came deep learning and reinforcement learning, and they got the perfect score uh, as a result. The only thing I'm trying to say over there is we, if we're looking at the potential of AI, we shouldn't just look at human intelligence and augment ourselves or assist ourselves, which is great, by the way, but also start to rethink or reimagine or, if you like, reinvent the whole way we look at our business and start to realize there might be a, thing, a few things possible over here that we deemed impossible before these technologies actually became available. I, I like that idea, and that's why I personally did a lot of effort to get the human intelligence thing out of the definition, because it's not only about human intelligence. It goes <coughs> beyond that as well. I think it's important to realize that. Now, in the last 10 minutes, I would like to um, quickly get you through two other areas as well. More to whet your appetite, by the way, and, and there are many ways to, to learn more about it, but more to whet your appetite than, uh, than anything else. But still, I hope you find it uh, interesting. So, so Technovision is our yearly uh, trend series uh, that we create within the CTO network. Uh, Patrick is our sponsor this year for the, for the autumn updates. And uh, when I tried to get the new cover for it, for the 2000 update, which is 2018 update, which is due for autumn, uh, October, beginning of October 2018, the graphical designer told me no. No, that's impossible. She, she was very stubborn about it. She said, this is a work of art, you know, and I cannot, I cannot share a preview of it and go away and don't bother us anymore. And so we said, okay, okay, you know, Chill out, uh, we'll, 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 do, we'll, we'll use the 2017 cover, okay, and we'll put a stamp on it. It's, it's soon to be here. So it's, it's, there must be a lot of anticipation right now. I mean, that cover better be really, really good. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you know, no, really, I, I said, okay, we'll do it, but it better be really good. But, but this 2018 update, so we have 37 different technology drivers and trends that we that describe in that document typically. And what we did for 2018 was systematically go through all of them and see what the impact of AI is. And to give you a little uh, flavor of, of what that means, um, we, we have uh, six big technology areas in Technovision. Uh, I will not bother you too much with it, but it's about uh, infrastructure, applications, data, process, user experience, and collaboration. It's really, if you think about it, um, a 101 introduction into a typical IT landscape nowadays. And what we did is for each of these areas, so infrastructure, applications, data, process, user experience, collaboration, we sort of assessed what the impact of AI was on it. And, and we, we found actually that there's literally none of these 37 technology building blocks that is unaffected by AI. There's an impact of AI on everything. And I, I don't have the time to really go through all of them. Uh, what you can do, by the way, is go back to your uh, CWIN registration site at, at one point in time, I'm sure you registered, hopefully online, through the website. If you go back to that site, just, just Google CWIN or Bing CWIN if you're from Microsoft. You, uh, Google CWIN and you'll find a uh, subscription, you, you can subscribe to a, um, um, a preview version of Techno, uh, an early release of Technovision the moment it becomes available, including this e extremely fancy cover, right? So, uh, so, so if you want to be uh, totally on top of it, uh, subscribe to it. A few highlights that I find particularly interesting. In terms of infrastructure, we're, we're creating a digital playground <laughs> in which the virtual reality and the, and the real reality, you know, so digital twins, uh, also uh, appear to be an extremely interesting playground for AI because we can test hypotheses. Once we start to capture in real time sensor data of, of devices and everything around us and we create a digital twin of it in our systems, it actually becomes a very suitable playground. Uh, so so it's, it's an ideal playground, uh, what we can do with infrastructure nowadays for AI. There is uh, obviously the whole notion of infrastructure itself becoming more and more autonomous. Patrick mentioned databases just now. Uh, people made career out of, of database management. And then last year at Oracle Open World, Larry Ellison was on stage. He said, hey, guess what? AI, we now have an autonomous database. It's completely self-healing, self-optimizing, self-running. You never have to touch it. Isn't that great news? He told the room full of database administrators. <laughs> he, was, he was like, hey guys, why, why aren't you laughing? He was a bit like the other guy last, 
yesterday. Why aren't you laughing? You know, this. Uh, why are you laughing? Uh, but anyway, uh, so so that is autonomous systems are are clearly. Uh, if we if we want to to run these these very complex data centers, if we want to com uh, run these very complex uh, networks, uh, databases, uh, autonomous devices, we realize that uh, we need AI uh, to actually get grip of that uh, complexity and and. Um, be able to do something uh, else ourselves. In, in, in terms of uh, applications, I would say, first of all, there are conversational front-ends. So we see a lot of the chatbot front-ends to applications nowadays, and they are obviously AI-driven. But I would say to application developers, there's virtually probably no application service that couldn't benefit from adding a touch of smart to it. Add some cognitive capability to it, some smart insights, some, some prescriptive analytics, and your application as you already have it, or as you are building it, might benefit tremendously by, by adding some, some intelligence to it. I think in terms of data, that, that's of course the bread and butter. Um, AI um, um, is, is clearly one of the core topics over there. But I think we'll see a lot of self-service and do-it-yourself platforms there, because the lack of data scientists and data engineers will be very, very clearly felt in the forthcoming years. They're difficult enough uh, to find. The, they're also sometimes difficult to work with, by the way, data scientists. <laughs> Trust the few data scientists in the room, yeah? Smart people, difficult to work with sometimes, you know? So, so you hire two with a free leave through the back door, so it's difficult uh, to get it. So we need more, I would say, AI-assisted platforms that help us to, to create uh, uh, the productivity that we're looking for. And as I said, small data. I get a pre-trained model, uh, you know, that, that I get from, uh, from, from um, uh, an industry best practice provider, and I only need to adjust it to fit my uh, business with, with some local training data, maybe, without having to understand what a deep learning neural network is and what the data science behind it exactly is, will help us to, to stay productive. Um, and and, and that, is, that is crucial. Self-healing processes, processes that learn from, from the way people engage with screens and take decisions. Robotic process automation, as many of you probably know it, is just the first step in understanding how humans interact with systems and then getting better and better in learning from how you actually d deliver a process and then be able to autonomously run it yourself. Um, so, so that's an interesting one. I've already considered it uh, sooner or later. You know, you don't even want a dashboard if your process is doing a very... Um, a, it's, it would be an autonomous business. So in the morning, you get into your office, if you want to be at your office, and you say, Alexa, run my business. You know, and that's it. I like that idea. Alexa, run my business. That's it. <laughs> I'm, I'm out now, if you need me. You know, it's uh, Alexa, run my business. Uh, user experience, obviously, you see a lot of VR, AR, virtual reality, augmented reality. I, I think there's a lot of uh, exciting AI behind it that is driving that uh, forward. Um, and, and we're also, uh, of course, there using, uh, in terms of the user experience, we're getting more and more predictive in terms of what somebody needs. You may have heard of the psychic pizza as a sort of a pinnacle of what we can do with predictive analytics. It's Friday evening, 7 p.m., you're feeling hungry, doorbell rings, pizza delivery boy. They just knew, they just knew you wanted that pizza, <laughs> and they knew it before you knew it, because they were so psychic, they were so uh, well aware of what you're going to do that they actually uh, deliver it to your front door. That's a psychic pizza. Uh, you know, that it has some data privacy issues. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you're hungry at 7 p.m. Friday night. Hey, I'm so glad. I'm driven to tears. You know, they know I wanted that pizza before I knew it. It's, uh, it's, a, fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating thing. Now, I've always said, if everything is autonomous, what's left for us? Well, I always said uh, writing haikus, of course. You know, writing poetry. The farm is running itself, as we already learned today. And have a look at the stand, by the way, the booth. Very interesting. The farm is running itself. No farmer needed. Uh, no dashboards actually needed for the farmer as well. Just Alexa, run my farm. You know, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. I'm writing haikus, I always thought. I'm writing poetry. And, and, then, and then AI writes poetry as well. That, that's, a little bit, uh, that's a little bit disappointing. Now, the Chinese poets say it's crap. What the AI produces, of course, they say it's crap, but we'll see, you know? So there's nothing sacred anymore, not even writing uh, poetry. So I'm, I'm sort of the end of my uh, presentation. Um, again, uh, do, do, do engage with your favorite Capgemini architect or other Capgemini uh, person to understand a little bit more about our applied way of, uh, of getting busy with AI. There's obviously, as you will appreciate, an, a strategy aspect to it, an activate, as we call it. So mobilizing, getting, getting acquainted with the technology. Um, 
And, and, and we use a lot of centers like this, the, the ASE, the Accelerated Solutions Environment, and also what Patrick mentioned, the Applied Innovation Exchange, as a way of doing that. So, so there's nothing like getting applied with the actual technologies, actually experiencing it, and then getting an idea of, of what it actually means. Then there's a lot, as I already described just now, to do in the application field and actually creating <laughs> solutions. It's not only a matter of creating neural network-based solutions from scratch, it's also a matter of injecting existing application services with touches of smart, maybe using a simple API to, to achieve that. It's also about intelligent process automation. I have people, they're involved in processes, they're using applications, let's learn from the way they do it. And let's get better and better in first augmenting them and supporting them. And maybe then sooner or later we'll ask Alexa, right, to run that business process for us. And uh, finally, one of the most interesting areas to me, most of the intriguing areas, is uh, the AI-first company, in which we completely reinvent or reimagine our business model. Not, not just trying to augment it or, or improve it or assist us in doing it. Actually think, what if AI would be at the very foundation of our business model? What would it look like? And we need to challenge literally almost everything that we've been doing ourselves, including writing haikus, by the way. You know, you have to challenge that even, uh, we, we now found out. These are, are three very interesting areas, a lot going on there, I will not bother with it, June, but we, we have galleries that we use a lot with these use cases I described earlier to you as a way to really get started with all of the AI and actually our mantra there is show, don't tell. We can tell you a lot about AI and I'm sorry for my 40 minutes of telling you about AI, but showing is better. And you'll get a lot of opportunity today to look at the, at the actual stuff, there's no substitute for that. And we use that gallery with all the demonstrators a lot for that. There, there's a lot of way of working with APIs for, for developers particularly, I tell them, this is not about data science and data engineering. There's a lot of different APIs that you can look at for vision, speech, language, knowledge, predictive, prescriptive analytics. And you can add these touches of smart through simple APIs to whatever application you already might have or might be planning to, to, to develop. So, so that's a very interesting area to transform as well. And then finally, of course, there is uh, the AI first experience, actually reinventing a company from the ground up uh, using AI. Um, it's, it's, uh, I cannot tell you too much about it, but we're currently working with the next generation cruise line. They're actually aiming for millennials, by the way, which is interesting, what, you know, millennials on the cruise. I don't know, can they even afford that? It would be my first question, but uh, anyway. Um, and, and this is all about being extremely psychic about, about the individual traveler, paying a lot for a cruise, and then be extremely proactive and understanding and emphatic about the individual needs during the journey of that, uh, what they call sailor. It's not, a, it's not a client, it's a sailor, right, on a cruise. I, I learned that, and they call it sailors. And, and, and being extremely uh, proactive and, and, and um, let's say, let's say uh, prescriptive and emphatic about the needs uh, are very crucial over there. And there's a lot of technologies, you know, that you could consider there if you start to envision it from scratch. I mean, I, I, I really would like to finalize with this one. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. It's a coffee delivery drone uh, patented by IBM. It actually flies around. It looks at your, your pupils and the way you're standing up and the way you're behaving and it thinks you desperately need a shot of espresso <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, really, really. And it flies to you and says, I will fill up your cup right now, okay? You know, and it does it. And this is not... I mean, IBM filed a lot of patents, and I'm starting to understand now why. But uh, anyway, it's an interesting patent, isn't it? Obviously, you wouldn't do this on a, a cruise, because with all the hipsters on board, it's, it would be a, a, a gin tonic drone, of course. But, uh, you know, imagine it would, it would know what type of gin tonic you want and when you want it, and also, of course, when you no longer are supposed to have one, right? <laughs> it's uh, quite easy to find out uh, about that one as well. So that's really what I wanted to tell you. I'm out of time anyway. Um, I hope you'll have a, a tremendous apply day today. As I said, sometimes it's about show, don't tell. So, so enjoy yourself for the rest of the day. And uh, when you're at lunch, just one recommendation, watch out for the low-flying drones uh, around you. <laughs> Thank you.